This will be an analysis of the Second Palestinian Intifada, Intifada meaning civil uprising, from the years 2000 to 2005. One of the key reasons I believe this historical event should be studied is because many classify Middle Easterners as being a collective rather than separate cultural entities whom have a plethora of cultural, religious, and political differences. This ambiguity leads to misrepresentations and stereotypes that in turn fuel fear of the Middle East, which recently can be seen throughout American media. In the words of Edward Albert, fear is the only true enemy born of ignorance and the parent of anger and hate. I will now begin discussing the Second Palestinian Intifada. The Second Palestinian Intifada was centered on disputes between Israeli and Palestinian territories and was said to be caused by Ariel Sharon and or Yazer Arafat. And I quote, in one version, Sharon, then the leader of the Israeli opposition, started the Intifada by going on an intentionally provocative visit to the Temple Mount on September 28, 2000. Alternatively, Arafat, president of the Palestinian Authority, decided that the new state of Palestine should be launched in blood and fire. He unleashed Palestinian militants rather than accepting a negotiated resolution of the conflict. It's a normal thing to visit the Temple Mount, and every Jew can visit the Temple Mount exactly as every Arab can visit any other place in the country. And uh, though all of us would like to have peace, all of us are committed to peace, I cannot see any possibility for a real peace if Jews were not allowed to go to the holiest place that belonged to them. Jews will be visiting the Temple Mount, their most sacred place, the holiest of the holiest, also in the future. But one thing what worries me is when I see what happened there, uh, I, I just think what will happen if Jerusalem will be divided as uh, Barak agrees to do already. How many forces will have there to be able to live there peacefully? We are looking for peace, but for us peace means security. For us peace means that everyone will be able to go and visit the holiest place, will be able to pray. I would say that is the simplest thing, I would say, it's so obvious in democracies where, uh, I would say, both of us live. And uh, therefore, uh, I'm sure that uh, the uh, sovereignty over the Temple Mount, it's in our hands now, it will be in our hands in the future. That will be the future. Though both of these leaders may be partially responsible for the revolts, and Sharon's visit to the temple may have been the last straw for Arafat. There are several other social and political matters that must be analyzed in order to grasp the violence that occurred across the span of these five years. To begin, the Oslo Accords, which were enacted in 1993, ensured Palestinian self-governance over select territories within the West Bank and Gaza Strip. However, the Oslo peace process failed to improve the Palestinian socio-economic standing as well as made obtaining other governing freedoms nearly impossible. As a result, strain within the Palestinian territories worsened. Palestinian frustration only furthered due to the failed attempt at resolving the Israeli and Palestinian conflicts at the Camp David summit in July 2000. The Camp David summit in Maryland included leaders Bill Clinton, Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak and Palestinian Authority Chairman Yazer Arafat. Issues involving religious territories, refugee rights, security measures, and Israeli-Palestinian settlements were all of interest in the time spent in Maryland. However, the meetings failed to enact an agreement on all four of these issues. I was shown around by British-born Palestinian Nancy Lansour. In 1935, her great-grandfather was shot in the head by Jewish settlers when they seized his home. She took me through the dense maze of warehoused refugees. Right. So, you know, when they came here in 1951, uh, they came and they got tents, and it was they rented this land, or the UN rented this land for them from the people that live in the city of Nablus. And so, uh, a couple of years later, the UN come and give them two stone houses per family. So, for example, in Bethlehem, um, in Dahisha refugee camp, there's a family that 
uh, had two stone rooms until up until two years ago we went to visit them and they had seven kids and themselves so you're thinking about a bathroom a kitchen um, I mean and they built a bathroom because usually they had public bathrooms out here <coughs> so it was like you know two rooms usually your kitchen in your front room and then a bedroom for everybody so it's you can only imagine <laughs> People will tell you, you can hear when people are having sex. Yeah. You can hear when people, you know, you can smell what your neighbor's cooking. Yeah. You hear every conversation. There's no hiding anything in these camps. This is a UN house here. You see this uh, white and red. Oh. So this is an original, uh, original uh, house. So after the tents, they got houses like this. And it was just like that. And that was their kitchen, their living room, you know, their bedroom. More than 2.2 million Palestinians are refugees in their own country, blocked in violation of international law from returning to the land they live just miles away from, packed into camps. These camps experience the highest rates of poverty and unemployment. Today, within the state of Israel, over 300,000 remain as displaced Palestinians. In the West Bank, nearly 800,000 people are UN registered refugees. But even greater, an unconscionable 1.1 million refugees are packed into the tiny, caged Gaza Strip, completely blocked by Israel from leaving. In addition to these disagreements, both Israeli and Palestinian sides prepped for violence, in part because of the fear the other would attack first. Younger Palestinian militants tended to share a common idea that violence would aid them in achieving what they were unable to attain when negotiating. All of these factors played a role in shaping the second Palestinian Intifada, and though Sharon and Arafat helped to turn what was already a tense situation into a violent one, it was a combination of both political, religious, and cultural differences, as well as social, economic, and authoritative strains. Turning now to the violence that occurred during the second Intifada, and I quote, there's something beyond political motives and awareness that inspire the incorporation of disorder into a quotation order. However, the necessities of survival and the physical and psychological capacities that people have had to learn and adapt to sustain themselves in changing circumstances also feed into a kind of agency that is no doubt quite prevalent in situation of ongoing violence, but what scholars have yet to adequately explore. This meant that Palestinians were struggling to survive, or as Alan Laurie puts it, to simply get by. To further this, roadblocks furthered the economic strains that Palestinians felt. They were implemented randomly and threatened the life chances of many Palestinians. This was due to high restrictions on what could enter and leave the Israeli territories, consequently hurting the economic trade relations between the opposing sides. Pulling from Chris Hedges' book, War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning, he touches on the topic of viewing soldiers as heroes. This played a huge factor in the violence seen during the Second Intifada. And I quote, Certain streets came to be referred to as Martyrs Passing, Martyrs Street, and Martyrs Square, now covered in commemorative martyr posters marking those locations that were famous for clashes or notable for how many people were killed in the area. Martyrdom is considered heroic in this culture because a death for a cause symbolizes dedication to one's morals, religion, and culture. Hedges also mentions on page 77 that the destruction of culture sees the state or the group prosecuting the war, taking control of the two most important mediums that transmit information to the nation, the media and the schools. The alleged war crimes of the enemy, real and imagined, are played and replayed night after night, rousing a nation to fury. Media and propaganda played into the fears of both the Israeli and Palestinian territories. Fear, as well as the pride of having to protect what each side considered sacred, fueled news sources as well as political agendas. Hedges argues that nationalistic views of one's country being superior also spurs violence. With both Israeli and Palestinian territories being driven by religious and nationalistic pride, conflict ensued. In conclusion, though Ariel Sharon and Yazer Arafat both played a role in worsening the tensions between Israeli and Palestinian territories, political, socio-economic, and cultural differences were the key factors in the second Palestinian uprising. These factors were presented in both the Oslo Accords of 1993 
and the meeting at Camp David in 2000. Frustration finally erupted into violence when Palestinian governments and Israeli governments increased their militaries. Though the end of the Second Intifada is still debated, momentum for the uprising lessened after the death of Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat. Though the violence continued to lessen, tensions still remained between Israeli and Palestinian territories in certain areas of the Middle East.